Okay. Hello everyone, welcome to the community interview. Uh, so we are here in Microsoft Ignite the Tour in London and I have here Mark Allen. So hello Mark. <laughs> it's, really good. <laughs> it's really good to have you here. Um, yeah, it's, it's good to be here. I, I, I've come over from Ireland to, to, so to get to be here. So yeah. That's really it's great. nice to be in London. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can give us an introduction about yourself, what you are doing, where are you based? Um, well, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm actually based in Ireland. Um, what I do these days is I help companies get their stuff into the cloud, their code and you know, data into the cloud. Um, I've actually been a developer for about 35 years oh. now, <laughs> but these days, obviously, it's not just development. There's you know, DevOps and data and infrastructure and all that sort of stuff going on as well. So, yeah. I've, yeah, for instance, at the moment, I'm working on a project where there's a you know, there's, the UK has a census every 10 years and the next one is coming up next year. Yeah. So I'm working with a company who have a product where they go out and collect information. And for, this is for small companies. So this has always been an on-premises based thing. But they've got the contract to work on the UK census, which obviously is covering the entire country. You know, by law, everybody has to return a form. So they've got 40,000 people going out into oh. the field and knocking on doors and things so what I'm doing is to help that company get all their stuff into the cloud so they can scale it up to the size that it needs to be to drive the UK census so yeah. that's the sort of thing that I do is to yeah. help people scale up like that that's great so can, can you give us an introduction about uh, that the topics that you are presenting in this event uh, yeah there's, there's two topics I'm presenting tomorrow uh, the first one is about Cosmos DB so it really explaining what a NoSQL database is how Cosmos DB fits into the landscape why it's such a good NoSQL database and also I'll be explaining some of the nice little things that you can do with it which you don't necessarily think about when you just think database. Yeah. Uh, the other one I'm talking about is it's called you know it's a slightly clickbait title but it's called containers versus serverless. Yeah. Um, so I'm talking about Azure Functions versus Azure Kubernetes service and how you can actually get serverless stuff running in AKS so that you kind of get the best of both worlds. That's so. really great. Mm -hmm. So what do you think it's important to understand, I mean, container VS uh, serverless? Yeah. Why? Um, well, basically, serverless is a great new paradigm. It allows you to scale up in, in a way that you never could before. You know, it's, it's great for small companies that might get large because you really only pay for the amount of stuff you're using, but it automatically happens, so you don't have to keep switching sliders or provisioning more stuff. Yeah. Um, AKS is a little more traditional in that Containers are great because they mean that you can pretty much lift anything you want and put it into, into a container and then run it anywhere, be it on-premises or in the cloud or on the edge. Um, but K Kubernetes has traditionally been more of an API-driven thing with a more static. Um, uh, so, But what's nice about it is that portability and that ability to run any code that you want. So. You know what, what I'm trying to do is to show how you can get the benefits of containers, but also get the benefits of an event-driven, serverless, scalable thing going on. So yeah, that's really great. Uh, so, and what do you see the future for for the container and the serverless? How do you see the future, and what is the change that you expect to? Um, the main problem that people have at the moment with Kubernetes is it, it's you know it's heavy he heavy heavyweight infrastructure. Yeah. It's not something that you can just easily walk into and say, okay, I've got some containers, I'll just run them in Kubernetes. There's a lot of stuff going on in there. It gets quite complex. You know, it's, you know, you need people who understand it and can run the ops. Um, where I would expect to see it going is people are trying to sort of simplify it so that it becomes more of a, you know, sort of an underlying concern. So in the same way as serverless has essentially got rid of the fact that you're, you're running on servers and you need, you know, you no longer need to care what servers you're running on or maintain them. You just it's, you know, essentially it handles it all for you. Um, Kubernetes is starting to go the same way where people are trying to build simpler layers on top of that. So although it's still running Kubernetes under the covers, something more understandable and more easily provisionable is on top of it. And you know, that's certainly where, yeah. certainly where Microsoft seems to be pushing things at the moment. Yes. Yeah. So. Okay, so how do you see the cloud computing uh, in the past, uh, present and in the future in terms of adoption and development? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Back in the day, 
you know, you, you've heard the phrase, the cloud is just somebody else's computer. And, and for a while it was, you know, when it was just infrastructure as a service, you know, the start, start days of the cloud, people were, you know, were really just saying, okay, here's my VM, here's my own friends' thing, just put, take my VM, run it in the cloud, and essentially use the cloud as a data center. Yeah. Now, Azure came at it from a slightly different point of view. They, they started off with no VMs at all. all. It was all what is now app service. So it was all platforms as a service stuff. Yeah. So, you know, you would take your website and database and deploy it up and it would take and ha handle again the un underlying infrastructure for you so gradually people are starting now even the ones who've been just thinking as an infrastructure thing they're, they're realizing the stuff you can do in the cloud which makes their life easier and gives you a lot more power and really starts to make use of the sort of huge elasticity and the huge power that you can get out of the cloud so that's where people seem to be starting to head now is to get rid of the vms and move much more towards cloud native services and to platform and to software as a service running in the cloud so that's where things are generally going is you know we're starting to drop the caring about what what you're running on and just really get the code out there and get it running get the data uploaded and you know let the cloud handle handle things that you don't want to have to handle <laughs> yeah so you are expecting more adoption oh oh absolutely yeah so every company is is looking at moving to the cloud there's, there's one or two that are still clinging on to, for dear life to their vms you know in their in their data center and on premises um some of the larger and and more established and slower moving companies but even those you know even, you know even big legal companies now are moving lock stock and barrel into the cloud banks have you know have started to cross the rubicon so they, they they've started you know one of them you know jumped and said okay we're moving to the cloud so all the other ones say okay well if they're going into the cloud we're going to go into the cloud so yes it's yeah adoption keeps picking up there's a less and less going on on premises these days certainly okay so th that change is too fast <laughs> so we, we don't have time to learning everything so how about adopt to that so from your experience uh, mark how we can keep up how we can cope with with that fast pace of um well i mean the, 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 from the point of view of keeping up um the first thing to do is to just sort of keep on top of what it is you're actually doing in your job so you know make sure that you've nailed down the stuff that you're working with day to day um what you will generally find is that then other services start to, you, you will notice things about other services either through reading blog posts or just seeing it on social media um but every so often you'll see something you know the, the trick is to think where would that fit if it won't fit into what you're doing leave it <laughs> if it will fit into what you're doing then start to look at that and start to work out how you can bring it in to to, to your projects um, so that, you know, that's how I would you know grow it. You know, there's, there's no point trying to learn everything in Azure because it's just too big. Yeah. You know, you, 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 most people couldn't even know about every service in Azure. Never mind know, you know, sort of in detail how to use them. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would say you know don't don't try and bite off more than you can choose. And, and for for the business, from the business perspective, yeah, um, yeah, for, from the business again, you know, e even if you're not working on stuff you know, yourself, yourself, if you're just you know there as the architect and stuff, then what you probably want to be doing is you know just keeping an eye as as new services are announced, you know. If you if you know the whole picture, you know that then there should be some way that you can bring that in, or it definitely doesn't apply to you. So, you know, be pragmatic about it. Okay. Essentially, great. Uh, how do you see the change in the job market or the job uh, demand between now and in the future? Um, the main change I've seen in the job market recently, um, there seems to be more and more call for data people and AI and ML, that side of things. You know, there's companies out there sitting on a lot of data, which they've just got sitting away in SQL somewhere. They've been collecting all this data for years, but they've never really made full use of it. So now that you can get cloud-based machine learning, you know, you can, for instance, in Azure, you can now throw automated ML at things and take essentially all your data and say analyze that and work out the best <laughs> the best model to use to analyze it yeah. but if you can work with that data and with that sort of thing then that seems to be a large growth area at the moment is a you know, companies wanting to do stuff with their data so you know even if it's just a case of knowing how to use automated ml rather than actually being a full-on data scientist and scientist and writing your own models and yeah. cognitive neural networks a big growth area
DevOps obviously also is, is growing quite a lot at the moment. Everybody's moving towards infrastructure as code, and so there's a lot of call for, you know, sort of, you know DevOps is, is a role now almost, rather than just something that, that, you know, developers working with ops or developers provisioning with, you know, their co infrastructure as code, you know, there's, you know, you get DevOps as a job role now. So. And, and you expect that this area will grow? Uh, oh yes, yes. Again, you know, you know, DevOps is it has kind of come out of the cloud. Um, it was, you know, with things like Puppet and Chef for a while, you know, you could do that sort of thing with your on-premises infrastructure. But now that you actually create machines and services and things in the cloud using code as well, you end up with basically everything that goes into the cloud being deployed usually in the end as some sort of template or some sort of PowerShell script or something like that. So, yeah. you know, that's, you know, that's coming again. As the cloud grows, sorry, the, that, so, so DevOps is growing as well. Yeah. So, so uh, people reaching out to me asking, I am a developer or a tester, is this yeah. enough? Should I learn anything else? Or, I mean, what do you mm. advise? <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, bare bones development isn't going anywhere any anytime soon i mean you know there the, the, the still needs to be the code you know computing always is and always has been and always will be data is here you do something to the data and you push the data out and then something else takes that data and pushes it and you can, does it so you know there'll always be room there for data people and there'll be room there for the, the code people and there'll be room for the people who are testing everything so you know that that's not going to change um Really, you just need to keep an eye on the patterns and you know, make sure that you don't end up in some sort of dead-end technology too much. Because you know, I know people who run into that where you know, they've, they've been doing something, but they just keep doing it and keep doing it. And gradually, the technology they use drifts off. You know, you know, technology never, change, <laughs> never stops changing. So you know, you, there is a certain amount of just keeping yourself educated on what's what's coming along the line and just even if you're not learning and using stuff you're just keeping an eye on what's changing yourself is, is very much yeah. very much a useful thing i would say but yeah don't don't, don't panic if you're just if you're just sitting there writing c sharp <laughs> you know, your job's not going to vaporize overnight or anything that's great thank you <laughs> so what is your advice for student and pre graduates how they can build their career and how they can join big companies Right. Um, I would say, well, there's two things. You know, again, because technology changes so fast, it's not necessarily so important. You know, what exactly you've done in college. So whether you did a C sharp or Java or Python, what have you. Um, what people are generally looking for in graduates is enthusiasm and just g general aptitude. So, for instance, if you've got stuff on GitHub or you've contributed to open source projects, that's always a good thing to show that you know you have the enthusiasm to go out and do something that's not just in your course, but something beyond that because you enjoy it. Or failing that, if you don't have the time or ability to do open source, then just make sure that when you go into an interview that, that you know, there's something that you worked on that you can talk about in some amount of depth and with some amount of enthusiasm. And let's face it, if you don't enjoy what you did in college, you, it's not really something you want to do as a job. So just make sure you can get that enthusiasm across because that's what people are looking for is aptitude and enthusiasm as much as specifically what it is, what technologies you've learned already. But you know, in college, you know, they're going to understand that you know, you're probably going to have done a Java-based course, but if they're for Python and you've done Java. It's just more important that you can show that you, you have an aptitude for programming in general. So what is your golden tip for pass an interview? Um, I would say just build a rapport with the interviewer. Um, enthusiasm again is, is, is that that's what you really want to do. If you, if you can, if, if you, they can ask a question and you can show that it sparked something in you that you know you, you understand this and you want to talk about it and you know you get it gets you excited then that will always come across very well with any interviewer um if you're in front of a whiteboard then you know you just have to get on with it but you know when it comes to the asking questions about what you what the things that you've done the projects you've worked on then you know just get that enthusiasm across yes, that's great finally from your experience how to be a high performing uh, professional in a company <laughs> high performing professional <laughs> to be honest you know, i find a lot of the a lot of what goes on is not again not so much around the technical side of things but you know software development is very much a team sport 
So the most important, single most important thing in anything that you're doing is to be good to other people. So when you're doing code reviews, you know, if you find a problem, say it in a positive manner. Um, don't just say, oh, I found that, you're wrong. You know, just work well with other people, be, be nice to them, talk to them socially, and, you know, just generally work, work as a good member of the team. And as long as you have the basic technical skills, I mean, obviously, you know, you know, if, you're, if you're rubbish technically, then eventually you're going to get found out. <laughs> but assuming that you have the technical skills, then the way you will, the way you will rise up is by, you know, people knowing you and people liking you even if it's only that when you go and get another job if you go for an interview in another place they will say nice things about you when when they're asked how how, how you did in your previous job so yeah. so yeah it, it yeah to be honest it's it's as much about you know the, what they call the soft skills but the human skills as it is about the technical thing, side of things yeah. okay thank you so much for your time it was really great to having you here and looking forward to have you in and see you in other events. <laughs> yes, well, hopefully so. Yes, if this one goes well, I'll try to do another one. Yes. I'm, I'm sure it will. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>